Symptomatic patients should first call their health care provider. So if you're symptomatic and you're, uh, you, you have uh, been to, uh, you've traveled internationally, you've been to an area where there's community spread, maybe even now California or Washington State in the areas where they have the most cases, um, or you have had exposure to someone that's a positive COVID-19, you should be tested. If you don't have any of those things, but you have symptoms, you should stay home. Watch yourself for 72 hours. Take your temperature twice a day. Hydrate. So we're in flu season. It could very well be the flu. You have none of those other exposure type of things. Um, but if you're symptomatic and you have those other, you fulfill those criteria, you should be tested. Yeah, those criteria have not changed. Mm -hmm. Those criteria have not changed. Will they change eventually? I like to follow what Dr. Fauci said. You know, if, um, if, uh, if you should be tested, in other words, you fulfill the criteria, you must be tested. Mm -hmm. But if you don't fill the criteria, eventually you want to be tested, you should be tested. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between really needing the test and really wanting the test. And if you need the test, you should get it. And that's where we are right now. I don't believe anyone that needs the test is not getting it. We do not have a backlog with the commercial labs. Everybody that needs the test can get the test. Everybody that wants the test, you know, I'm, I'm you know, second, second cousin twice removed from someone who tested positive, mm -hmm. eventually you should be able to get the test. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be opening up testing centers that will be for symptomatic uh, individuals. Um, immediately with a uh, doctor's uh, prescription. Mm -hmm. Closing that loop uh, is really important right now uh, because if somebody does test positive, we don't want people to walk in, test positive, say, because I want it, and not have any follow-up if they don't have a treating physician. Right. Okay. And so there's, you know, and so we're looking at special populations. You don't see all of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how about the homeless popula population? Uh, we have to connect uh, very closely with our FQHCs. It's not as simple as saying, let's all have a test. We have been nonstop on this since we, um, we first started here at the department with our crisis management team, uh, January 24th. So the minute we saw what was going on in China, we realized that something big was going on. And then February 2nd, Super Bowl Sunday, we got a call that EWR was going to be a funneled airport, and we had to arrange uh, to screen 350 uh, passengers coming from all, you know, coming from China, but you know, from all, you know, uh, all different states uh, by 11 o'clock the next morning. Uh, so we did, and we ended up with one quarantined uh, traveler that um, we were able to, after a 14-day quarantine, move to in, her home uh, in Indiana. So it, it, Those first few days when you were, January 24th, you decide, did you come in this room and yes. have a small meeting? Uh, no, actually the, the group was about um, all the key people from um, licensing, from uh, um, uh, uh, integrated health, uh, my chief of staff, uh, communications, emergency management, the whole, yeah. It's, yeah, it fills the room. Mm -hmm. And we um, have met at 9 a.m. every day, Monday through Friday, and sometimes on weekends since then. Mm -hmm. It was our, our whole team. I yeah. don't take full credit for anything. Um, it was our whole team when, you, you know, we would have our regular staff meeting, senior staff meeting, and say, what is going on in China? What do we think about this? The predictions are pretty uh, stunning, so let's, let's get moving. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't realize from January 24th actually to February 2nd when we got that call that ever, all the preparation work that we've done was the easiest part of this. <laughs> and then February 3rd, the governor um, uh, wrote and uh, promulgated an executive order uh, for the coronavirus task force, which are like the leads of uh, all of, of the other commissioners. And that was, we, we've been meeting weekly uh, since then. 
uh, and that was to say, what is the role of every department? What do they have to consider? And, you know, in the beginning, when, you know, slowly uh, travelers were coming back and we were seeing some positive cases, a lot of that was the preparation work. Does everybody have an emergency preparedness plan? What does it include? What are the things you have to be concerned about? And again, we, you know, that was all codified uh, very early on. Uh, I don't think any of us at that point thought it was going to, um, thought the transmission was going to be as significant as it is. Mm -hmm. And the more you learned about it, I mean, this, I think we were thinking it was going to be like H1N1, mm -hmm. uh, serious, um, but, but, not, not, but right. not as stunning as what we're seeing now. This week actually is totally consumed with how many testing sites, where do they want to be, mm -hmm. when can we get them up, what is the guidance, and what is the criteria for who gets tested, how do we make sure, who does the swabbing, we're, who's responsible for education and training, which we're doing, we, we, right. we will do that. Um, how do you close the loop between the specimen, the test, the result, back to the treating physician or primary care physician and then to the patient to, and the uh, local health officer who are boots on the ground ha, we have that has to be ironclad so that's what we're doing and at the same time working with our hospitals what are their immediate needs uh, personal protective equipment is high on their list as you can imagine uh, but at the same time that they're dealing and we're helping them deal with the immediate needs uh, we are planning for a surge. Uh, trying to look at different algorithms about what do we think this is going to look like? How many additional beds do we need? How many additional critical care beds? How many additional ventilators? So we're doing surveys. We're looking at hospitals that have closed uh, within a short period of time, within the last five years. Oh, you can, well, oh yeah, this is um, the um, school closures, meals, child care. Uh, testing, that's really important. The schools were big, working with uh, Commissioner Rappelat, and then you'll see testing. Uh, the last thing is medical advisory, working with NJHA. We want a group of uh, physicians throughout the state to be in close contact with us so they can help us, uh, uh, their boots on the ground, and they can help us be more um, sensitive and aware right. of what's going on. And then we have, well, you can see testing, testing. That's been a lot. The testing collection process for mm -hmm. the specimens, um, hospital bed availability. Um, oh, it's, it's just, it just speaks to all the parts you have to think of. Yes. Like, you're yeah. not just thinking, people are seeing you tell us every day how many people have tested Oh, that's, positive, yeah. It's like just yeah. a corner. Of that's just a corner start. of what we're dealing with. For example, mm -hmm. um, schools can close maybe from a mitigation intervention, good thing to do. 40% right. of nurses nationwide are the primary caregivers of their children or single parents. Right. So if we close schools, what do we do with daycare and childcare? Mm -hmm. Can we use the empty schools to um, allow those particular, not only now healthcare workers, how about um, police women and or uh, men or women, anybody that is essential mm -hmm. in a crisis. If, they, if they're home, what, what happens? Mm 